Hey everyone, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, as Sean said, I am going to talk about exploiting Windows Group Policy for Reconnaissance and Attack. Uh, I, I gave a variation of this talk at uh, B-Sides in Las Vegas, if any of you were at the last B-Sides or Black Hat DEF CON. Uh, so I wanted to bring this talk up to date a little bit and uh, provide it here. Uh, this picture is more than just self-serving. It's a metaphor for group policy. So this picture is me. Uh, I do bike riding and bike racing in my not so spare time. And uh, group policy is a lot like me in this race. It thinks it's really powerful until it's not. And this race is actually capturing a moment at, uh, this picture is actually capturing the moment in, a, in this race. It was a, like a 55 mile race with 6,000 feet of climbing. We started at 8 o'clock in the morning at this particular day. It was like 85 degrees at 8 o'clock in the morning. So it was going to be a really nasty day, really hilly race. And I felt really good at the start. And I went out in the front and I found myself alone at the front within the first 200 meters. Like, for some reason, everyone was taking it easy except for me. And I'm like, what the hell? So I kept going. And I stayed out for almost the whole lap, which included like a five mile long climb. And then down the back side of the climb, starting up the next part of the climb. And suddenly, I looked behind, and the entire pack was there. And they started up the next climb, and I exploded. And that's a lot like group policy. It's really powerful until it's not. And what I'm going to talk about in this talk is really why it's not or when it can go wrong from a security perspective. And what's interesting is that I've been writing and talking about group policy for the 20 years that it's been in existence. And it's only in the last like three or four, maybe five years, where I've started to think about group policy as, a, as an infosec problem. And really, the, the, the kind of aha moment for me was when I went to a B-Sides in Las Vegas like maybe three or four years ago when the Spectre Ops guys, uh, Rohan, Harmjoy, and uh, Will Robbins, uh, Andy Robbins, introduced uh, Bloodhound. And when Bloodhound got introduced, a, a big part of what Bloodhound was was interrogating your Active Directory infrastructure, inc including group policy. And using that to be able to move laterally in an environment up to, you know, in some cases, domain admins. But whatever your goal is, it sort of facilitated, Bloodhound facilitated that process. And so I began to look at group policy in a different way. Um, this is all my contact and various information. Everything I'm going to talk about, I've written articles about on my blog up here. I was a 14-time uh, group policy MVP with Microsoft until they summarily executed all of us um, because we were doing on-prem and Microsoft wasn't. So, or at least they weren't thinking about it as much anymore. Uh, I have a group policy training course that I just updated. It just dropped like two days ago um, on group policy fundamentals. If you're wondering what this group policy thing is all about, although at the end of my talk, you may want to be as far away from that as possible. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and turn on my little clicker. And I do have some projects that are group policy related up on GitHub. You can find them under GPO guy on GitHub. And you'll see some, I'll refer to some of them here. So what I want to do is kind of just lay the found, a foundation on group policy, how it works, how it's structured. How many of you would consider yourself maybe novices of group policy? Or at least know what group policy is, but maybe aren't? And then, OK, so how many of you just live your whole lives in group policy land? Yeah. OK, so I, hopefully this will be beneficial. But the point is. Group policy is this thing that is built into Windows and Active Directory and has been forever, right, since Windows 2000. And it is, was designed to provide a, conf a centralized and scalable configuration management capability in Windows. Um, it's also a roadmap to your organization's security posture. And I'll talk about why that is in a minute. But, you know, group policy really, uh, fulfilled, I think, its promise of providing scalable, centralized configuration management. Now, you can argue that it, didn't, it made some choices that you probably wouldn't have made in hindsight. 
But the point is that I know organizations with literally millions of endpoints that are still using group policy as their main configuration management solution for Windows. And it, and it works. It just works. I mean, for the most part, it just works. Referring back to my picture, where you get into trouble is when you try to get too, much, too fancy with it. Um, but by the, for the most part, it's still, it, it just works. Uh, so it is a roadmap to an organization security posture. It is also a malware delivery vehicle, as we're seeing in the modern era. And I'll talk about what that means. I don't mean literally that you know, people put malware in it to, well, I do mean literally that people put malware in it, but it's not on purpose. Um, and it, of course, is all of the above. What is it typically used for? So this is a graph that came out of a poll that I do on a periodic basis of all of my 17,000 odd mailing list subscribers that use group policy. And as you can see, uh, the, the majority of them are using it for general lockdown at the top, security hardening, uh, general registry tweaks down below, you know, everything, scripts, log on scripts, startup scripts, software deployment, not so much anymore. But, you know, in general, a variety of tasks for configuring your endpoints. And interestingly, I think it's fair to say that people are mostly doing group policy on desktop systems. But they, what the one thing that they will universally use group policy for on servers is for security hardening. You know, Microsoft, CIS, NIST put out these security baselines for this is a secure Windows server. This is a secure Windows desktop. People import those templates. They're basically group policy backups that they're importing into their environment, tweaking so that they don't break all of their line of business apps, and then deploying those. So group policy is the main mechanism for hardening of Windows. And it's also the main mechanism for other things, which I'll talk about, if I can get this to go forward. Let's see. Yeah, I don't have a Surface. Sorry, I don't work for Microsoft. <laughs> they, they hand them out like candy to those people. <laughs> um, so a little bit about group policy and how it works. So group policy is actually two pieces. Um, this is arguably one of the more brittle parts of the group policy design. But there's a part of the GPO, group policy object, that is in AD, that's in Active Directory. And there's, every GPO has a representation of an object in Active Directory. And then there's part of the GPO that lives in what's called sysvol. Sysvol is just a file system on every Active Directory server, Active Directory domain controller, that's replicated to all of those Active Directory domain controllers. Now, interestingly, it uses a different rec replication scheme than AD itself, so they're not always in sync. When you make a change to a GPO on directory server A, it may, the two pieces may replicate at different times out to all the other Active Directory domain controllers. That's gotten a lot better in modern versions of Windows, but in the early days, that was a big problem. But the bottom line is, you have these two pieces, the GPC in AD and the GPT in Sysvol. The GPT is where most of the settings are stored for the GPO. When you define a setting in a group policy object, chances are you can find an underlying file in the file system in the GPT for that GPO that has all of those settings defined. Now there are some areas of policy that will define settings in the AD side, but it's very rare. So how does group policy processing work? So the first thing to note is it's, it's a client side process, right? When you're, there's, there's no concept of pushing policy from AD to a client. A client could be a server or Windows desktop machine. There's no concept of pushing policy. It's always waking up the client and getting the client to go request policy from Active Directory. So it's strictly a client side operation. And it's broken into these two parts. There's the GP core part, which is the part that wakes up and says, what are the GPOs that apply to me as a user or computer in Active Directory? And then there's the client side extension part. This is the client side extensions are the things that implement each of the different policy areas in group policy. 
So in group policy, you have registry policy, you have what's called folder redirection, you have software installation, you have security policy for doing security hardening, maybe audit, you know, configuring auditing, <coughs> configuring service accounts or services on Windows. All of these things have client-side extensions that do the work of applying the settings in the GPO to the client. And that's basically how group policy works. Now, GP Core takes care of figuring out, again, which policies apply, and then CSEs do the work of implementing those policies. Now, settings are either per computer or per user. So the point there is that group policy, despite its name and containing the word group very, very distinctly, has nothing to do with groups. It applies to computers in AD or users in AD. Now you can filter a GPO to only apply to a set of users in a group or computers in a group, but the actual thing that is being targeted in Active Directory is a user or a computer. GP processing runs in the context of local system on that client machine, so it's the most privileged process on that machine running group policy. In the case of per user policy, about three or four years ago, Microsoft changed the behavior of per user policy where it would run in the context of local system and temporarily impersonate the user that's processing the policy for user policy to deliver the settings to that user. But by and large, it's running as local system. And it refreshes on clients and member servers every 90 minutes plus a 30-minute randomizer so that you know, you know, if you have a million desktops on your network, they're not all refreshing at once. Uh, so there's a, you know, in a sufficiently large network, you will probably have group policy refreshing on your domain controllers, you know, hitting your domain controllers every, you know, every few seconds because it's just randomly banging against it to get a refresh. Now, the important thing to know about that is, and, we, and you can take advantage of this as an attacker, is that group policy doesn't actually reapply the settings every single time it wakes up. It only reapplies the settings normally when something changes. Something meaning you've added a new setting to the GPO, thereby incrementing its version number, and the client says, oh, I have a new version of that GPO, I have to apply it. Or you've moved the client, the user or computer account in AD to a new OU, and so a completely different set of, OU, of GPOs applies. So those are, those are kinds of examples of change events that cause group policy to change or to, to get reapplied. But the point there is that let's say nothing changes and you as an attacker have admin access to that box and you decide to undo a policy so that you can do your nefarious tasks. Group policy will wake up at some point in the near future and it will think nothing has changed on AD and it will leave your setting alone. So this is why I, I tell people, if your users or bad guys acting as your users are administrators on their boxes, group policy is completely useless. You might as well not even bother using it. It's another, yet another in the long line of arguments why you should never, ever, ever make your regular users administrator on Windows. Question. You could actually, um, you used to be able to just get not, like, say if you locked down your box completely and, and you could get this quick knock down, you used to be able to just, if you had admin, you could go to the gpci file and deny administrator, but, yeah, and then uh, reboot the machine, and then you would just get everything back. Yep. Yeah, Right, so he's, he's talking about tricks for kind of forcing a refresh of the of group policy without, you know, without actually, like, basically for making the client think that it hadn't gotten group policy. And there, it's a good point, and there's, there's ways to do that. I actually wrote a utility a while ago called Touch GP, where you could just touch the AD version number of that GPO, the GPC I mentioned earlier, increment it, and that would be sufficient to get all the clients that process that GPO to reprocess it, thinking something has changed. You can also do it with something, uh, a command line utility that you're probably all familiar with if you use GP called GP Update. GP Update has a switch called Force, and that does the same thing. It basically says, I need to reprocess everything. Now, another interesting kind of side 
a f artifact of GP client-side processing is the security client-side extension will automatically refresh all of its settings every 16 hours by default. That's set in somewhere in the deep in the bowels of the registry. But it was something that Microsoft put in there to ensure that even if nothing is changing, I can refresh security policy so that if somebody did muck with it, it's going to fix itself every 16 hours. And you can actually tune that down to make it happen more frequently. Now, GP targeting, there's an order of precedence to GP po policy processing. And this is part of the complexity of group policy is that for a given computer or user, I could have 50 GPOs being processed. And there's an order of precedence in them starting with the local GPO that exists on every Windows box, all the way up to site link GPOs. In other words, you can link GPOs to IP subnets in Active Directory. Domain link GPOs, in other words, the whole domain. And then OU link GPOs. And so GPOs process in that order. If there are conflicts, guess which one wins? The last one wins. Last writer wins is group policy's mantra for resolving conflicts. It's not very deterministic, which is another problem with group policy. You sort of have to be a wizard to figure out what my effective policy is. In a typical large organization that I, t that I am you know, often dealing with, it's, you know, <laughs> it's all bets are off in terms of what the effective policy is on any given endpoint, which is part of the problem. Um, you can further target GP by security group by what's called a WMI filter, which is essentially a WMI query against the endpoint. So in other words, security group filtering, WMI filtering, and this thing called GP preferences item level targeting are all ways of narrowing the scope of a GPO above and beyond where it's linked in your AD hierarchy. And all of those things at, that, at the bottom of that list are evaluated dynamically at the client. It's not something you know ahead of time unless you're querying every single client. So that makes the problem of figuring out what's effective on a given endpoint really difficult. And then, again, I already said this, but it doesn't change unless it's, something has changed. So let's now talk about, with that kind of foundation about group policy, why it's such a great tool for attackers. So, as I mentioned, many IT shops use group policy for security hardening. NIST, STIG, CIS, Microsoft Security Baselines, all are delivered as group policy object backups that you can import into your environment. And they use group policy to configure some really juicy bits from a security perspective. Local group membership, for example, who's in the local administrators group. If you read the Microsoft Pass the Hash white paper, it talks about tiering. How many of you have heard of admin tiering? Tier 0, Tier 1, Tier 2, right? So tiering is an incredibly great idea. The idea there is that if I'm a domain controller administrator, I should not be able to log into workstations and servers. I should only be able to log in with that account to domain controllers. Same for server administrators, only servers. Same for workstation administrators, only workstations. The benefit of that is that these Privileged people are not leaving their NTLM hashes littering LSAS memory on workstations and servers if I'm a domain controller admin. Because once one of those things gets compromised, as we saw in Ryan's talk earlier today, a very simple Mimikatz command, and I've got your hash, and I've got your network. Not a good situation. So, you know, group policy is used for configuring that tiering in that Path to Hash white paper document. It's used for configuring user rights. Who can debug the operating system? Who can act as part of the operating system? Who can load and unload device drivers? Uh, again, admin tiering. It's used for configuring password policy, as Ryan mentioned earlier. And formally, but not anymore, it used to be used for configuring local admin passwords via GP preferences, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And to make matters worse, group policy objects are world readable by default. So any authenticated user on your network can ask group policy who has permissions to what where. And that's exactly what Bloodhound does. We talked about Bloodhound in Ryan's presentation. Is one of the switches on the Sharphound collector of Bloodhound is 
go find out who has admin on which boxes. So I know which boxes to go hop to to get credentials to go hop to the next step. And I can draw a map using group policy of who is privileged on which boxes. So some of the tools that are out there for doing this reconnaissance, um, all they're doing is essentially giving you a way of easily parsing group policy from the command line or from scripts and asserting some of this information. So PowerView, PowerView has a lot of commandlets in it for recon. There's a bunch related to group policy. I'll show one of them in a second. Sharphound is the ingester, the data collector for Bloodhound. So you run Sharphound first. It generates this big, long JSON file. And then it gets sucked into Bloodhound, that graphic that Ryan showed with all the connections everywhere. Those connections are built from that ingester file. And Sharphound's doing that. So you can run Sharphound and see all of these relationships in text. There's an awesome tool written by a guy down in Perth, Australia, Mike Loss, called Grouper2. Grouper2 is specifically designed for sussing out group policy vulnerabilities, the likes of which I'll talk about in my talk. And then I wrote a script called Get Vulnerable GPO. I'll talk about what that does. But essentially what that does is it looks for security hardening policy, and then it looks for weak read, world readable permissions on it. And then finally, remember I said that group policy preferences used to have passwords in it until Microsoft disabled it, and I'll talk about why. But essentially, I, I wrote a little GUI tool that goes and finds all those and then lets you remediate them. So let me just quickly drop into my domain controller, and I can show some of this stuff. Hopefully, you all can see this, but let me just give you an example of some of these. So let's start with one of the PowerView commandlets, find GPO computer admin. So what this is doing is it's looking for, it's looking in group policy for who, is been, who has been made administrator on this machine called Win10 client. So if I run this commandlet, it's going to go out, suck out the group policy, and you can see here there's two entries in here via group policy preferences, which has the ability to add users to groups, it has found that the tier two admins group has been made part of desktop administrators as part of administrators on this machine. And this is the GPO that enabled that or in implemented that. And then down here, domain users has been made part of the ad administra administrators group via restricted groups policy. So somebody has gone and added domain users into local administrators on this machine. So easy, read-only access, unauthenticated user. I, I don't need to be any privileged user to run this utility. I've just figured out, for this particular machine, who, is the, who are in the administrators groups on, on this machine. Um, Sharphound is a little bit more detailed, and it's not going to meet, I'm sorry, Grouper is a little bit more detailed, and I'm not going to go through all of the output in it. I'll let you do that yourself. But what you can do with, gr with Grouper is it goes out and sucks out all the information that it can read out of your GPOs, and it looks for interesting vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities is the interesting weaknesses in your group policy configuration. Everything from what I just showed about local administrators to uh, references to MSI files in GPOs that are on read-write shares that you could muck with. And I'll talk a little bit about the so-called external paths vulnerabilities or weaknesses. Um, but the point here is that it's looking for interesting weaknesses in your group policy configuration that can be exploited by an attacker. And then finally, uh, this little utility that I talked about. Let me see where I put it. Um, up, 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 up here. This uh, GP preferences utility that I wrote just goes out and looks for GPOs that have implemented group policy preferences passwords. And I can just simply right click and say remediate it, and it will essentially blank out the password. I'll talk about why this password is so bad in just a second. So tools for reconnaissance. Oh, that was nice. 
go back here. All right. And I did it again. All right, attacking group policy. I'm going to go through each of these vectors. Uh, this is uh, probably more information than I have time for, but I'm going to just try to get through them. And if you have questions, I'll try to answer them at the end. So GP preferences, I just showed why this, or how you can find these. What was this? So local passwords were stored in Sysvol. Those passwords that I could define in GP preferences for, let's say I wanted to set the administrator's password on all my workstations to a specific value. Or maybe I did it in like 10 different GPOs for 10 different values, right? Perfectly reasonable thing to want to be able to manage and rotate your admin passwords on your machines. The problem was is that Microsoft, it wasn't really their fault. And Kevin in the back of the room who gave us a great talk on um, Microsoft Endpoint Manager was part of the parade of fun <laughs> that Microsoft had to go through to document all the protocols in all parts of Windows as part of, I think it was part of the antitrust settlement with the government. And in part of that documentation was the encryption key, which was a, a fixed, non-rotating, static encryption key that was used to encrypt the passwords in here. So guess what? <laughs> it's really easy to figure that out when you have the published encryption key on the internet. So people wrote utilities to be able to decrypt these passwords in Sysvol. Again, with read-only access to this GPO, anyone can read the encrypted password in Sysvol and decrypt it and therefore have, in a lot of cases, admin access on, on desktops. We, we do make it hard to find these documents. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is, this is security by obscurity defined. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so uh, hopefully, you know, Microsoft grayed out the option of even using this, but there were a lot of shops that had this implemented. And that's why they came up with LAPS, if you're familiar with LAPS, local, administ local administrator password something, blah, blah. That is the alternative, more secure method. But this is still out there, and this is something, this is like low-hanging fruit for an attacker. That's the first place they go. So if you haven't already gotten rid of these things, Get, them, get rid of them. Uh, OK. GPO settings. Weak write permissions on the GPC or GPT for one or more GPOs. So what's the opportunity here? If you can write new settings into a GPO, you can tell the GPO to do anything you want. So there's a, in PowerView, there's a nice little commandlet called new GPO immediate task. And what it does is it writes a scheduled task into GP Preferences scheduled tasks for, to do whatever you want it to do. I got an email from a friend that I've known for a long time about two, three years ago. And he asked me, I just had to deal with a customer whose entire network was ransomware encrypted. Thank you. And do you have any idea what this means? And he showed me uh, some log files and such. Essentially, what the attacker did is they got into the network, found some weekly permission GPOs, wrote a new scheduled task to distribute the ransomware via group policy. That's why I talked about it as being the malware delivery vehicle. That essentially using group policies, power of group policy against itself to distribute that. And this is a common attack path these days. So having you know, right access to GPOs should be severely, severely limited. Um, now, again, you have to have write access in order for this to be effective. So it doesn't work everywhere. It also has to be a GPO that's linked to a large audience. The, the obvious targets there are going to be GPOs linked at the domain, or as I'll talk about, GPOs linked at the default domain, or at the domain controllers OU, which is where all the domain controllers sit. But the point is, if you can get to a GPO that's linked to broad numbers of users and computers, and you can write to it, all bets are off. GPO links. So this is another one where if you have poorly managed permissions on OUs, on sites, on the domain level, such that anyone can write to the GP link attribute, they can add an arbitrary GPO to that container. So let's say they were able to modify a GPO, but it wasn't linked anywhere. But then they found that they had write permissions on the domain level. 
for this GP link attribute. They could add their GPO to that attribute, and suddenly everyone in the domain <laughs> will get their policy. Question. Another group that that you, you don't need to write one. This is exactly the case. You, there are so many. The point here is if you have the ability to write this GP link attribute on container objects, or you have the ability as an attacker to write settings into GPOs, you can do anything you want. You have the environment. Um, I'm going to just drop out just for a quick second to show you something interesting. So this is going to sort of illustrate why it's so bad to give somebody G, uh, write permissions on, G, on certain kinds of GPOs that are linked in really bad places. So for example, I have the default domain controller's policy. This is, the, the, this is linked, this is one of the two built-in GPOs that come with AD. Can't really remove it. This GPO is linked at the domain controller's OU, which means it's processed by all domain controllers. In delegation, I've granted help desk admins the ability to edit settings on this. Don't ask me why, but it's just there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to my client machine. Let's pretend that my client machine is just a little old machine that a help desk admin has logged into to help this end user. And therefore, my LM hash is in memory on this machine. An attacker comes along and gets my LM hash and starts a session as the help desk admin on this machine. Very common scenario. Now, if I were to try from this help desk admin's shell, if I were to try to do a remote management session, Mike was just talking about PowerShell remote management, it'll, shell, it'll tell me that I have access denied. Access is denied here. I can't do it. But I have this nifty little script that I wrote. Let me type out the script so you can see what it looks like. It's just called injectme.bat. And all it's doing is it's injecting restricted groups policy into the existing security template, gptemple.inf, in the default domain controller's policy. And because I'm as a member of help desk admins, which has edit permissions on the GPO, which, by the way, I can discover because the GPO is world readable, if I run this script, Oops, let's see. I might have changed the, oh, that's right. I, I did it in PowerShell because I was having problems with, yep. So I ran that script. So now let's simulate the domain controller waking up every five minutes to refresh policy. And let's say in the worst case scenario, nothing has changed on this GPO or in, in this GPO. So it's going to take 16 hours for this to go into effect, right? Because I said that Security policy doesn't update, will we'll automatically update every 16 hours. I'm going to go ahead and force this. Oops, if I can spell. So, so when I force this to get refreshed, the DC is getting the new policy that I just injected into it. Now, if I come back to my client machine, and small prayer to the demo gods. I am now on the DC using remote management. So I essentially injected myself. I just basically created myself as a domain controller just because I had write permissions on that GPO. Uh, not as a domain controller, as a domain admin. OK. So I, uh, OK, so I'm going to try to zoom through this, unfortunately. Um, External paths. What is an external path? Let's say I have a logon script in a GPO that's run by every user when they log on. Let's say that logon script is in a network share. The GPO might be locked down so that, not, so that you know, only privileged users can edit the GPO. But what about the share where the logon script is? What if that's not locked down with the same permissions? Anyone that's right access to the share where the logon script is 
can edit the logon script to do whatever they want. These need to be aligned. You have to match the permissions on your GPOs from a delegation perspective with whatever external references exist. And external references can exist in any of these areas. I mean, it could be a matter of, no, I'm not going to worry about that. It could be a matter of scheduled tasks referring to files external to it, installation of, of software referring to MSI files on a package server, whatever shortcuts referring to some other location. Any of those things can be an external reference that you and an attacker could go after if they know that there are weaker permissions on those external paths than there are in the GPOs themselves. GPT redirection is another one where you're taking advantage of weak write permissions on the GPC, the AD part of the GPO, and you're saying that instead of using your normal sysval path to find settings, I'm going to go look at this other SMB share over here. So when I, when I published this article, this guy in Germany, Tagnol, he came up with a little trick. So you can redirect the path defined in the GPC to an SMB share. If you've heard of Impacket, Impacket allows you to create arbitrary SMB shares. He basically used that to redirect the GPO to. And when an administrator went in to edit the GPO, he captured the, the hash of that administrator on Impacket. Just by, just by redirecting that, that uh, GPT path. So, I mean, there's a couple things that, you know, doing this, it kind of breaks the editing and reporting side of GPOs, but if you're an attacker, you can get away with it for a little while, and you, you have this opportunity to collect some hashes. Or, or just have, you know, fake group policy files. From a processing perspective, it still works the way you would expect. Um, ADMX abuse, this is about writing to the ADMX files that are backing administrative templates. If I can write to them, I can make arbitrary changes to say, don't write to the normal location you're writing to when this policy is enabled, write to my location. And I showed in my blog entry, I showed how I took a policy that was very commonly used. It's called always wait for the network at, user, at computer startup and user logon. And I changed the ADMX file to actually disable user account control when this policy was enabled. And so the next time an ad admin comes in and just enables that policy, their thinking is this policy about, you know, always wait for network, it enables or disables Lua on all of their systems. And then finally, starter GPO abuse. Starter GPOs are not very often used, so this one's a little bit less interesting. But essentially, if you can write to a starter GPO, and if somebody makes a GPO out of your starter GPO that you've compromised, they pick up all of the settings that you've compromised in the starter GPO. Starter GPOs are like templates. So what can you do about this? Well, you could not use group policy or not use group policy for security hardening. Um, I think that's not a bad recommendation, for at least for security hardening. The problem is there's not a lot of great alternatives. There are some. Uh, so you need some alternative, but if everyone is looking for group policy and you're not using it, then you've already done yourself a service. Um, but the more probably, l the less drastic one is to reduce the visibility of your GPOs, especially the GPOs that you're using for hardening. What this means is every GPO by default is granted authenticated users read and apply group policy. Take that away for all of the GPOs that are doing per computer hardening settings. Replace it with domain computers. What that does for you straight away is it says, OK, no longer can any arbitrary user read this GPO. It requires you to be local system on a computer in the domain to read this GPO. Now that's still, you know, it's a, it's a higher bar. It's not an impossible bar. If you wanted a more difficult bar, you could say, only have it security filtering for the, for the computers that are applying this policy. So you create a security group, put all the computer accounts in it, and put it on here, and only those computers can read this GPO and, app and, apply, and apply it or process it. Uh, a little checklist. Who can write to critical GPOs? 
treat any GPOs linked at the domain or o, domain controller OU level as writable only by tier zero admins. I just showed how having write permissions on these GPOs is essentially the same as compromising the whole domain. So tier zero means only domain, domain controller administrators should be able to write to those GPOs that are linked at those domain and domain controller OU levels. Who can write GPO links? Treat any SOMs, so scope of management, site domain OU, that can impact critical system, like at the domain level, the site where DCs are, or domain controllers OU as tier zero. Again, for the same reason. Who can write to the ADMX central store? It should only be tier zero or tier one admins. No one should be able to write new changes to ADMX files except highly privileged users. And then making sure that your GPC and GPT permissions are consistent. This one's a little bit more obscure, but what I've found in large organizations is over time, the ACLs on their AD look atrocious. They have you know, put ACLs in place because somebody couldn't get access to something, and they checked the box that said inherit all the way down the tree, and all these ACLs end up in objects that they shouldn't be. And if, if somebody has the permissions to write to a GPC, the AD part of the GPO, independent of whatever you've defined in, a, in GPO delegation, then that's a part, that's a weakness. Because that can be discovered, again, because it's readable by everyone, and it can be exploited. Same with the sysfall part. And then external path permissions. For any GPOs that reference external paths, log on scripts, MSI file, external ex executables, their permissions on those resources should match the GPOs. If I can write to the GPO, I can write to those paths. If I can't, I can't. That was really fast, sorry. Yes, question. Sharp, Sharp Hound does not find external path references. Grouper 2 does. Sharp Hound is really designed to do what Bloodhound does, which is find paths to domain admin. And actually, it doesn't even use group policy primarily. You have to tell it to use group policy. Primarily, it will go out and collect session information directly from the endpoints to see who's in the administrator's group, who's logged onto this machine, et cetera. Good question. Other questions? Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sorry it was so fast. <laughs>